Denise Wells was born September 22, 1970, and went by her middle name, Denise. At the age of 23, she was a single mother of a little boy named William living in Haskell, Oklahoma. She planned to visit her childhood friend, Melissa Shepard, in Bergen, New Jersey in April 1994. She began traveling across the country and eventually made it to the Pike Motel in Carlisle, Pennsylvania on April 12th after getting lost more than once. At 7 p.m., she called her friend Melissa and said she was going to eat at McDonald's and then go back to her motel room to take a nap. They made plans for Melissa to meet her at the motel around midnight, although some reports say that they made plans to meet up the next day. After talking to Melissa, she went to the front desk and asked for directions to the nearest McDonald's. They saw her leave and get into her rental vehicle, a white 1993 Plymouth Acclaim with Oklahoma license plates. Shortly after midnight, Melissa went to the motel to meet her as planned, but brought two men that she later said she worked with at a dance club, but there was no answer when she knocked on the door of her room. She spoke with the staff, and they entered the room using the master key. However, Denise wasn't in the room, and all of her belongings were there, including her room key. Her suitcase was sitting open on the bed, and some of her clothes were lying next to it. There was a magazine and a pack of cigarettes on the bedside table, but the bed itself didn't appear to have been slept in. Hours later, at 5.30 a.m., her rental car was found abandoned in a remote area on Route 274 near Germantown, Pennsylvania, 35 miles from the motel. It appeared to have stopped in its tracks in the westbound lane. The driver and passenger side doors were wide open and the vehicle was out of gas. The hazard lights were switched on and the battery was dead. Some empty soda bottles, a pair of shoes, and maps were found inside the car. Investigators found that she had driven nearly 700 miles farther than the distance from Oklahoma to Carlisle and may have gone as far east as Burnville in Berks County before doubling back to Cumberland County. It's believed she may have been closer to New Jersey at one point than doubled back for Cumberland County, but it's unclear where the extra miles for sure came from, but it's possible they came from her getting lost multiple times. A small amount of marijuana was found in the car, as well as other unspecified indications of criminal activity. Her change purse, containing a small amount of cash, was found in a nearby ditch. The car itself was mud splattered and scratched, suggesting someone had driven it off-road. Investigators determined that Melissa had suspiciously received a phone call 17 hours before Denise arrived to Carlisle from someone in Carlisle, despite claiming to have no ties to the area and no friends there. Around Thanksgiving in 1994, around seven months later, the wife of Denise's married boyfriend claimed she had heard from her. Denise allegedly called the woman and said she had gotten married and wouldn't be coming home. This story hasn't been confirmed, and police don't believe Denise actually made the phone call. Others later told police that Denise was visiting Melissa to help her deal with some kind of unspecified trouble. Melissa later stopped talking to police, and her current whereabouts are unknown. Her mother stated she was handling her life well and loved her son, who was later raised by his grandparents. Police have not named any suspects in her case, but stated they believed some of the people they interviewed knew more than they disclosed. Denise has never been found, and as of today, this case remains unsolved. Michael Anthony Hughes was born March 21, 1988. In 1975, when his mother, Suzanne Savakis, was just a child, her mother, Sandy Chipman, was serving a 30-day jail sentence in Dallas, Texas. While her mother was in jail, her stepfather, Franklin Delano Floyd, would kidnap her and her three siblings. He was originally in prison after getting into a shootout with police following a bank robbery. However, he served his time and was released, but then went on the run while on parole. During his time on the run, he would go by the alias Brandon Williams. It wasn't until her mother was released from jail and came home to an empty house that she realized her husband had run off with her children. She told law enforcement that Williams, who was actually Floyd, had kidnapped her three daughters and infant son. However, she was also told she couldn't file a kidnapping charge because as a stepfather, he had a right to take them. 
She discovered that two of her children, two and three-year-old Allison and Amy, had been dropped off at a children's home run by a church but she was unable to track down her oldest daughter, six-year-old Suzanne, and infant son, Philip. For some reason, she did not tell law enforcement that she had allowed baby Philip to be adopted by a co-worker and the co-worker's husband. Although he was an infant, he was not Floyd's child as his mother had married Floyd within weeks of meeting him and he had no interest in the infant. Suzanne was then given several aliases by Floyd over the years, including Tanya Hughes, Tanya Dawn Tadlock, Suzanne Davis, and Sharon Marshall, and he spent years moving her from state to state while trying to avoid authorities. He basically abused, manipulated, and groomed her for the next 14 years. In high school, Suzanne was a good student who was rarely allowed to have any friends over. But one friend was eventually allowed to come over one night and found it strange that her teenage friend owned lingerie. Floyd took them to a bar, watched them dance, and after bringing them home and brandishing a gun, her friend got scared and said she never wanted to go back to their house ever again. At one point, Suzanne was enrolled in a school in Oklahoma City under the name Suzanne Davis. She ended up graduating from high school in Forest Park, Georgia in 1986 as Sharon Marshall and wanted to go to Georgia Tech where she had earned a full scholarship to become an aerospace engineer. At one point, she ran away with her boyfriend who would later be confirmed as her son Michael's biological father. However, Floyd tracked them down in Alabama and forced her to go back with him. On March 21, 1988, she gave birth to baby Michael in Tampa, Florida, while apparently using the alias Tanya Dawn Tadlock, the name of a girl who died of pneumonia in Alabama years ago. It is known that Floyd used the aliases Charles Hughes and Clarence Marcus Hughes during this time, which is why Michael was given the last name of Hughes at birth. Floyd then married his stepdaughter, Michael's mother, in New Orleans in 1989 under the names Tanya Tadlock and Clarence Hughes. She then had to hide her relationships from Floyd, and one friend even encouraged her to run away from her older, creepy husband. Suzanne told her Floyd said he would kill her and her son if she ever attempted to leave. At one point, she became an exotic dancer at a strip club. It's believed that this career was chosen by Floyd because he felt it would be easier to hide her identity and because she was less likely to meet people who would help her recognize and escape from her abusive relationship. In 1990, both Floyd and Suzanne were wanted for questioning in connection with the disappearance of Cheryl Ann Camesso. She was a dancer at Passion Strip Club in Tulsa, Oklahoma with Suzanne or Tanya Hughes as she was known by at the time. Prior to Cheryl's disappearance, witnesses saw Floyd attack her outside of the club. Floyd had been obsessed with her, but became angry after she turned down his advances. Cheryl then retaliated against Suzanne by reporting her for receiving illegal benefits. Her remains weren't found until 1995 and weren't identified for another year. Before any legal action could be taken against them, 21-year-old Suzanne was found near death on the side of the highway in April 1990 in Oklahoma City down the road from a Motel 6. She had been in a suspicious hit-and-run accident and was found with groceries scattered around her. Police believed she had been struck from behind in a hit-and-run while walking from a convenience store to a nearby Motel 6. When Floyd arrived at the hospital the following day, he claimed he had fallen asleep at the Motel 6 after she had left to go buy groceries. For days, she was unresponsive and mumbling daddy. He would never allow any visitors to see her and she would later die after a final visit from Floyd at the hospital. He asked for her organs to be donated and for her body to be cremated, but no one knew at the time what her true identity was. The medical examiner discovered many old injuries and cheap plastic surgery operations. Floyd even preached about sin at her funeral that her co-workers had raised money to pay for. He then called about two life insurance policies that he had taken out on her months earlier but accidentally gave his real social security number. Upon running his social security number, it showed he was a convicted child molester on the run. Floyd placed two-year-old Michael in foster care in Oklahoma after Suzanne's death and left town. 
His foster parents, Merle and Ernest Bean, who kept him for almost four years, told authorities that he had limited muscle control and was emotionally unstable, nonverbal, and often exhibited hysterical behavior when he first arrived at their home. However, Michael made great progress in foster care and the Beans had begun adoption proceedings for him. Floyd tried to get Michael back at one point, believing and claiming that he was Michael's biological father, but a paternity test proved he and Michael weren't even related and therefore he was unable to get custody. Investigators began probing Floyd's background after Michael's mother's death. They learned he was a career criminal who had been arrested in 1960 at age 17 after a gunfight with law enforcement during a robbery. Floyd had also been convicted of assaulting a four-year-old girl in 1962. Floyd had been stalking the Bean home where Michael lived and where he was being well cared for. On September 12, 1994, Floyd abducted six-year-old Michael from Indian Meridian Elementary School in Choctaw, Oklahoma. He held a gun on the principal and forced him to retrieve Michael from class. He then forced Michael and the principal into the principal's pickup truck. Floyd tied the principal to a tree in a nearby field where Floyd had been camping out and escaped with Michael. The principal was rescued a few hours later and was not physically harmed, but Michael has never been seen again. A month after the kidnapping, the stolen pickup truck turned up in Dallas, Texas. The next year, while the truck was in a body shop, the owner discovered an envelope on the top of the gas tank with 97 photos. Many of them included Suzanne as a child and explicit poses from the age of four through her adolescence. Other images of young girls were also located in his vehicle and one appeared beaten, but it was unknown who she was at the time. It was later determined to be Cheryl Camesso, the dancer and co-worker of Suzanne, that he was later convicted of murdering. Floyd was arrested in Kentucky two months after kidnapping Michael, but he refused to say where Michael was, only saying he had taken him to a safe place. During his trial, Michael's biological father found out that he was Michael's father and he never knew Suzanne was pregnant. Many people testified against Floyd and his evil actions. The government had witnessed statements detailing alleged confessions by Floyd regarding Michael's death. Floyd's sister stated that Floyd said he drowned him in a Georgia motel when the two were taking a bath and he asked Michael if he loved him and he said no. Other witnesses stated that Floyd told them the same thing and another person claimed he saw Floyd bury Michael in a cemetery. Floyd would defend what he did, saying Michael is his son despite what a blood test showed. He stated he is placed where his dad deems to be in his best interest. It's none of your business where he is, nor do I care how much any of you in Oklahoma miss him or love him. He was convicted of Michael's kidnapping and was sentenced to 52 years in prison. While in prison, Floyd was finally charged with the 1989 murder of Cheryl Ann Camesso, who was sadly a 19-year-old mother of three children. Floyd has a history of mental problems and was initially declared incompetent to stand trial, but regained his competency in a state mental hospital. After his conviction, his lawyers tried to mitigate his crime by having him testify about his bad childhood, but he was ultimately sentenced to death, and while in prison, he began admitting to committing many crimes. When interviewed in prison in 2014 while on death row, Floyd told the FBI about his marriage to Suzanne and her mother. He disclosed she was Suzanne Marie Savakis, the oldest of three daughters of a woman he married in North Carolina in 1974, shortly after becoming a fugitive. FBI agents visited Suzanne's mother, who identified a photo of the girl as her daughter, and a DNA test confirmed this. So 24 years after her death from the hit and run, her true identity was confirmed as Suzanne Savakis. After 20 years of lies, he finally told the FBI that he had indeed killed Michael on the same day he abused the child. He said he had planned to raise Michael himself, but the boy had grown apart from him during his four years in foster care and no longer loved him. He said that during the drive to Dallas, Michael had gotten out of control and he couldn't handle his behavior, so he shot him the same day that he kidnapped him. He said he'd buried Michael's body on Interstate 35 at the last Oklahoma exit before the Texas border. Looking at overhead photos and maps in January 2015, Floyd was able to point out an area where he said the shooting happened. 
The FBI's evidence response team and anthropologists from the University of Oklahoma sifted dirt in the 2,000 square foot area for 16 hours but found nothing. Authorities stated it was likely that wild hogs in the area would have consumed all evidence if he had been there. In 2019, a man came forward named Philip Steve Patterson, believing that he was Philip, the baby boy that his mother claimed Floyd kidnapped at the same time he took Suzanne while she was in jail, and DNA tests confirmed his identity in 2020. His adopted mother and father, Mary and Bob Patterson, adopted him from Floyd and his wife when he was just six weeks old. He was originally named Philip Stephen Brandenburg at birth. You can read Mac Birkbeck's books, Finding Sharon, the sequel to the international bestseller, A Beautiful Child, for further details regarding Suzanne's story and the monster who turned from evil stepfather to kidnapper to husband to killer. If Michael is alive, he would be 33 years old, and as of today, Floyd remains on death row, and Michael's fate and his mother's death remain unsolved. Monique Christine Daniels was born June 16, 1976, in Biloxi, Mississippi, to Candace and Burton Kenneth Landman, and grew up in Moore, Oklahoma. Monique was described as brave, sweet, caring, and funny, and was nicknamed Nikki. She attended Moore High School and dreamed of becoming a doctor and helped raise her five younger siblings. Monique was abused by her biological father, who later went to prison for sex offenses of his four children. Her mother divorced him and remarried Charles Chuck Daniels and had two more children. In 1992, Monique lived with her mother, Candace, stepfather Chuck, and her three siblings and her two half-siblings. Candace and Chuck were both sergeants in the Air Force at Tinker Air Force Base in Oklahoma. That same year, on June 2, 1992, a neighbor reported seeing Monique loading clothes into a blue Chevrolet pickup truck driven by an unidentified white man, possibly the last time Monique was ever seen alive. Her mother and two of Monique's siblings, Angelique and Brian, were out of town that week on a church choir trip. Angelique would say that while on the trip, her mother was acting very strange. When they returned home, Monique was gone, with Chuck saying she had run away again. They also found the house in disarray, which was strange because it was normally kept very tidy. There were beer cans and cigarette butts lying around, and there was an empty pregnancy test box sitting on the bathroom counter. Monique had indeed run away a short time before this, after getting pregnant, and them forcing her to have an abortion. But this time, they didn't appear to search for her like they did before, according to her sister Angelique. Chuck and Candace did not report her missing, and did not seem concerned. Her sister Angelique said they basically erased Monique from their lives. They would not allow their other children to talk about Monique and even had new family portraits taken to replace the ones that had Monique in them. In fact, Chuck reportedly said the house was so much better and tranquil since she was gone after putting up the new family portrait that didn't include her. In January 1993, Monique's maternal aunt contacted the police to inquire about her case and learned that no missing persons report had been filed. She asked Candace about it, and two days later, she said Monique had called home and spoken to her younger sister Angelique and said she was safe. A week after that, a letter supposedly from Monique, postmarked Dallas, Texas, arrived in the mail, and months later, another letter arrived. The letter said Monique had gotten married and had a daughter named Chelsea. It also said she and her husband and child were currently living in Alaska, but her husband frequently traveled for his job. Monique's aunt asked the police to check the handwriting on the letters and see if it was really hers. The day before Candace was supposed to bring the letters to the police for the examination, the house was supposedly broken into and the letters stolen. In 1994, at the age of 15, Angelique ran away from home and took a bus to Michigan to live with her aunt. When she left, Candace and Chuck reported her missing immediately. After Angelique arrived at her aunt's home, she told her the truth about the letters from Monique. She said Chuck had convinced her to go along with his plan so that her mother would feel better and had even driven her to Texas so they could mail them. She said the phone call from Monique was a lie her parents came up with as well. 
She then filed criminal complaints against her mother and stepfather, alleging physical and mental abuse. Her parents tried to get her sent back home, but a judge ruled that she was safer with her aunt. Sometime after the allegations went public, Chuck and Candace transferred to Germany for the military and stayed for 10 years before moving to Florida where Candace worked as a middle school teacher. When the police asked Chuck about Angelique's allegations, he admitted they were all true. Candace finally filed a missing persons report at this time, nearly two years after she went missing, but neither of them would agree to take a polygraph test about Monique's case. One of Monique and Angelique's brothers, Andrew, also alleged there was child abuse in the home. He later stated that on June 2, 1992, Monique and Chuck had been arguing as usual all day. Chuck decided to go on a spontaneous fishing trip with his three sons and told them to say goodbye to Monique. According to Andrew, Chuck allegedly only let them say goodbye to her through her cracked bedroom door. When Andrew looked in, he saw Monique sitting cross-legged and unmoving on the floor and could only see her legs. She didn't say anything to him when he spoke to her. Years later, he broke down and said that he didn't believe that she was alive at that time. But according to his brother, he was allowed in and spoke to her and she was fine. According to Andrew, they left to go fishing in the pouring rain without their fishing poles. Chuck then drove for two hours in one direction, took an exit, stopped at McDonald's to eat, then drove back home. He parked in the garage and left it there with the boys inside for approximately an hour while he was inside the house. Chuck then left the boys inside, told them he was going to look for Monique, and locked them in his bedroom for two days while he was gone. He allegedly returned and then left again, taking one of the boys who recalled that there was an oil barrel in the back of the truck at the time but the boys were all young and have little memory of many details. When questioned by the media about Monique's siblings' allegations years later, Chuck and Candace denied them and claimed Angelique was mentally unstable and unreliable. Police did dig up the yard at their former home to see if Monique was buried there, but found nothing. Some people, including her sister Angelique, strongly believe that Chuck harmed Monique. However, Chuck died in 2019, but Candace is alive and is still a teacher in Florida, but she is not considered a suspect in her daughter's disappearance. Monique has never been found, and as of today, this case remains unsolved. Sheila Ann Davini was born November 3, 1973, to David and Susan Davini. She was described as the life of the party. She grew up in Maysville, Oklahoma, and in high school, she was a cheerleader and dated a boy named Tyson. The couple later married, but reports claim that she suffered an abusive marriage and addiction was involved. The couple would later have two children, Ty and Morgan, but would later divorce. Years later, she remarried, but that marriage didn't last long. She moved back to Maysville and lived next door to her parents. She earned a degree in science from Murray State College and planned to also earn a degree in teaching. Meanwhile, she and her ex-husband, Tyson, were in the middle of an ugly custody battle, and at one point, she had gotten a restraining order against him, claiming abuse of her and the children. Child support was scheduled to triple when Tyson began working a high-paying job in the oil field. She never received any child support for Morgan and Ty, and about $20,000 back child support was owed. Tyson's attorney kept filing continuances, but she was supposed to be receiving child support and permanent custody of the children. But on January 6, 2004, Sheila took her children to school at 8 a.m. On her way back home, she talked with a good friend on her cell phone, and when she drove up, she told her friend that she had to hang up because she had a visitor. A couple hours later, a neighbor passing was alarmed that her trailer was on fire. When her brother and father showed up, her father rushed into the trailer looking for her, but due to the danger of the fire, the brother made him come back outside. Sadly, Sheila was found dead inside by Maysville firefighters. It was determined that three separate fires had been started in her trailer. Someone had started a fire on a propane heater in an attempt to make it appear to be the source of the fire. The stove top was left on and a pot on it, another possible attempt to make it look like an accidental fire. But the Garvin County Sheriff's Office did not initiate an investigation. 
An autopsy was performed, but authorities refused to reveal the results for over nine months, even though evidence of foul play was obvious. The state fire marshal's office allegedly refused to admit that the fatal blaze was anything other than an accidental house fire for nearly a year, despite what the Maysville volunteer firefighters and the liquid propane gas inspector had to say in their reports. Turns out, accelerants, benzene, and toluene were also found in Sheila's lungs and blood, so she was likely alive but unconscious during the fire. Eventually, her cause of death was listed as homicide on her death certificate. An agent with the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation later allegedly told the Devaney family that his agency knew who carried out the arson and murder, but would not act on the information since there was no consensus. Even though the reports of other agencies were ultimately amended to reflect an arson and murder, the OSBI made no arrest. The Davini family ultimately spent a year and thousands of dollars petitioning for a grand jury in Garvin County, which convened in 2006. Sheila's ex-husband, his wife, and his brother all invoked the Fifth Amendment under oath and no indictments were handed down. In 2009, a second grand jury was convened via citizen petition in Garvin County regarding the suspicious death of another local man involving many of the same law enforcement officials. Sheila's family applied to have her case revisited before that jury, citing previous evidence and newly discovered material, but the grand jury declined to hear the matter. It wasn't helpful that the evidence from the trailer was destroyed initially only because it was assumed to be an accident. No arrests have been made in the murder of Sheila, and as of today, this case remains unsolved. Carrie Beth Boldman Thomas was born in 1962 and was a 30-year-old mother when her life was cut short. On October 26, 1992, about 7 p.m., she called the Oklahoma City Police Department and reported that someone was harassing her and stomping on the roof of her mobile home at 6202 Daisy Lane. Police and a helicopter investigated but never spotted anyone near the home. She then called her mother at 9 p.m. and said she was on her way to pick up her brother so she wouldn't have to be alone at her home. She called her mother again from a payphone at Southeast 15 in Huddy Bird Drive in Midwest City, Oklahoma, and said her pickup had run out of gas. Her mother arrived 20 minutes later, but Carrie was nowhere to be found, but she did find her orange Dodge pickup truck sitting next to a nearby car wash. 39 days later, on December 4, 1992, her body was found on the side of Cemetery Road, about a half mile south of Memorial Road in Oklahoma City. Travelers said they hadn't noticed her body there the day before. It appeared that she had been deceased for a while and the body was possibly buried elsewhere and then moved to this location. This location was beside the entrance road to an oil field drilling site and police believed she was left there the night before or early that morning. The person that she reported to be running on her mobile home roof the night she went missing was Jesse Dwayne Hysaw. His criminal history is very lengthy and includes charges such as aggravated battery, kidnapping, burglary, possession of illegal firearm, and drug charges. Upon further investigation, Carrie's daughter later discovered that her mother had missed a court date on November 5th during the time she was missing and had a warrant for her arrest at the time she died for failure to appear. The court date was for charges of concealing stolen property in which Jessie Hysol, the same person she accused of harassing her just two hours before she went missing, was a co-defendant and facing more charges than her. However, in 1994, charges against him were dropped. Police questioned Hysol after Carrie's death, but he denied being involved. No one has ever been arrested for her death, and as of today, this case remains unsolved. At the age of 21, Shara Marie Jones was living in Claremore, Oklahoma at 639 Archer Court with her mother Mary Vo and working at a local pharmacy. Shara suffered from bipolar disorder that required medication but complained that the medication wasn't working. On September 21st, 2015, she became upset but it's unclear why she was upset. She left home on foot but would leave behind her phone and vehicle. It was the last time she has ever been seen. 
She would make two transactions at a local come and go market, but there has been no further activity since then. However, she wasn't reported missing until two weeks later. Her mother said she waited this long because it wasn't unusual for her daughter to get upset after they had an argument and leave, but said she had always returned and would call her mother while she was gone. There are very little details available about Shara and her case, and as of today, this case remains unsolved. <laughs>